ecosystem goldfish pond in a basin. In 2021, when COVID and circumstance washed me back up on Australian shores for a year, I made this pond in the courtyard of my father's home. It replaced a barren expanse of white pebbles bracketed by two out-of-control clumps of bamboo, which I guess was the previous owner's idea of a Japanese garden. My father had two requirements for letting me build it. One, that it be low maintenance, and two, that he wouldn't have to feed the fish because it was always likely that I'd disappear again to another country at some point, and he didn't want to have to worry about caring for it. But actually he feeds them all the time. He even bought special expensive goldfish food on the internet. So I decided to make an ecosystem pond. What is an ecosystem pond? Before I left, my parents asked me to write out any instructions for the pond, so I made a pond manifesto. I like manifestos, and I explained how the pond ecosystem should work. The pond is designed to be a natural ecosystem. The fish eat algae and convert it into fish crap, which is converted by bacteria into nutrients for the algae. I find ecosystems fascinating. From the ecosystems of the oceans and sand dunes I grew up with, to the ecosystems in the soil of my bonsai pots. The way that a variety of species in an environment will tend to balance and become self-regulating. Bacteria, plants, predators, and prey, all keeping each other in check. And it amazes me that I can assemble this group of plants and animal species and create a balanced ecosystem in my backyard. Let me explain the pond ecosystem a little better. The circle of life exists in my pond. Because it's a circle, you can start anywhere. But let's start with my goldfish. The goldfish eat algae and poop out fish waste. The fish waste contains ammonia, which is broken down by bacteria that convert it into usable forms of nitrogen. And more nitrogen enters the pond through debris, dead bugs, and the occasional treat of fish food. The nitrogen is then taken up by the plants and by the algae, which the fish eat, and so the cycle continues. If you think about this, you'll realize that there is a problem. Nitrogen keeps getting added to the pond, but it's never removed. Instead, it gets stored in the plants. And this is why the pond has become so overgrown, and why I now need to do something about the plants. Landscape. Any overgrown shrubs on the edges, except the junipers, should be pruned back to low organic mounds when they become overgrown. Planks. These are okay to walk on carefully. You can put any plants or decorative items on the planks. I put these railway sleepers at the back of the pond because I thought they looked cool and also to be a display shelf for my bonsai. As it turned out, their most important use has been as a bridge to the back of the pond. But over time, the left sleeper has subsided and when it rains and the pond gets full, it does come into contact with the water. So I need to raise it up a little higher.
Some more sphagnum moss through this mesh will give the plant roots a path to the water and in time will establish a natural looking bank. For now I put some of my current bonsai projects on it, next to my broken ammonite fossil. My war with the mint. Every decent gardener will tell you you never plant mint in your garden because it's impossible to control. So I don't know what it was exactly that possessed me to plant mint on the bank of my pond here. But predictably it's gotten out of control and now I need to get rid of it. I try to avoid using chemicals, but in this case I can't pull it out because the bank will fall apart. Uh, I can't use vinegar or something like that because the acid will get into the water. So I think the only solution is glyphosate, which is not a great chemical, but I don't think it will hurt the fish any. I use a paintbrush to apply glyphosate to the leaves and cut stems so as to minimize its impact on the pond ecosystem. Bamboo Mountain. Bamboo Mountain was built atop the stump of one of the clumps of bamboo that I took out when I was making the pond. I used the soil I got from excavating the pond to build it up and shaped it with sandstone rocks. I used a sphagnum moss mix and clumps of green moss to keep it together and give it texture. And the ridge line at the top was molded over an old branch. Here's how it looked in its prime, but unfortunately while I was gone it was allowed to dry out and the soil became hydrophobic, so most of the plants died back. I use a mixture of sphagnum moss and garden soil to build up the ridge again. It's kind of a budget version of the muck mix that you'd use in bonsai. Use what's left to give it contour. I plant some fast growing ground covers. The roots will help to hold the structure in place. I also bought this pack of cottage garden flower mix for Bamboo Mountain. No need to be too fussy about it, that's for sure. For now, keeping it hydrated until the plants can establish is the most important thing. History, genealogy, and sex lives of the goldfish. The first goldfish in the pond were Bluey, a red and white comet, and two feeder goldfish I felt sorry for at the pet shop, and I named those two Beatty and Turtle Food. Later they were joined by another comet, Goldie Two, named after a cannibalistic goldfish of my childhood, and two Shabunkins. The two Shabunkins I got at the same time I added Papyrus to the pond, so I named them Pharaoh and Moses. Unfortunately, both Bluey and Turtle Foo died after a heavy rain event when the pond turned over. Goldie too was always a particularly stupid fish who liked to eat things that weren't food, and I imagine this is what brought about her demise. However, before her death she was, I believe, the mother to many baby goldfish, unfortunately leaving my pond with a legacy of particularly stupid goldfish. Pharaoh disappeared one day, probably taken by a kookaburra, and his body was never found. Of the six original goldfish, only two still survive. The fish seem to breed every spring, so my original six goldfish have now become 15 or 20. Most of them don't have names, and they're more inbred than the Habsburg dynasty. Try to keep the mint from growing into and taking over the carnivorous plants. After two applications of glyphosate, the mint is struggling, but still not gone. I decide to just cut it back to its base and plant this Australian native swamp plant where it was growing and hope for the best. As always, the fish are very curious about any changes in their pond. Sorting out the water plants. With the pond edges sorted out, the only thing left to do is to cut back and remove the water plants. Go away, fish! They're freaking me out. They're biting me. Ow. A strange <laughs> sensation. They suck on you. 
I decide to pull them all out to deal with them. Unfortunately, this means getting in the pond, which is not something I like to do. The pump out, which is good. My documentarian has to capture the moment as it is. I expected there would be a lot of organic muck at the bottom of the pond that needed to be cleaned out. But in actuality, there is very little. The ecosystem has broken down this material well. I don't think I'll be in a rush to do this process again. It runs the risk of damaging the pond liner, and the benefits seem minimal. Next time, I'll just cut the plants back above the water line. After a couple of weeks, the pond is doing well. Life has returned to Bamboo Mountain. The mint has not re-emerged and the carnivorous plants are growing again. And I have three new Shabunkan goldfish. Their names are Midnight, Ferrotu, and Dumbo. Hopefully they will improve the gene pool of my pond. But summer has grown late and I have to go back to Korea. I wish I could find as much balance in my own life as exists in the ecosystem of my pond. But I think I'm forever caught between places, desires, people, and feelings. And I don't know where exactly I should be. But a life that gives me two summers a year can't be too bad. Hopefully the pond will stay well and balanced until I can return.